Hi students, welcome back to geology. Today we are learning about maps. Okay, so most of us are familiar with the map that's on our phone, right? It is a basic road map. If you're using Google Maps or Apple Maps, you're using a basic road map. It'll show you the locations of roads and highways and some other landmarks like restaurants and things like that. Um, but it won't show you elevation. So what we're going to focus on in geology is looking at maps that show us elevation. So that's going to be our topographic maps. So this is going to show elevation and water features. And then sometimes we do see some of the occasional landmarks and things here and there. Um, but it is not as road detailed or street detailed as your street map or road map would be. Um, most of us are also very familiar with world maps. This helps us depict all kinds of different things. Um, we don't just use it in geology, they use it in geography, chemistry, physics, all different walks of science um, to depict different things. Um, so this could be weather, geology, plate boundaries, volcanoes, lots of stuff, right? And then specifically in geology, we also have another type of map that we use called a geologic map. And this shows us the geology of an area. So this map right here shows us uh, different colors, right? And those different colors are different types of rocks that we would see. A lot of times these are projected onto a topographic map. So you not only see the geology, but you also see the elevation this geology is occurring at. Um, so we will kind of look at both of those things in tandem, but mostly we're focusing on topographic maps today. All right. so. These are two dimensional models of a 3D world. So we take the 3D earth and we compress it down into a 2D representation so that we can actually carry it around with us. And so these are always scaled down. So your map is not gonna be the same size area as it covers, right? Cause it would be really big. So we don't do that, <laughs> we scale them down. And the lines that you see, you can see them on this map here in this image, these lines are contour lines. So sometimes the topographic maps are referred to as contour maps, but it's the same thing, like right? topographic versus contour. We're looking at contour lines, we're looking at elevation above sea level. So in the United States, the United States Geological Survey or the USGS puts out a very standardized topographic map called a quadrangle. And so in the late 1800s, the USGS started mapping everything they could in the United States. And this took a long time, right? Because now we use satellites. Satellites were not used there. It was all groundwork, right? It was somebody on the ground taking measurements and then recording those measurements. And so that can take a very long time. Um, but for about 50, 45 years, we got a lot of maps created about 55,000 maps were made in the, in the continuous United States. So this is everything except for Alaska and Hawaii. And then eventually we started making maps of Alaska and Hawaii. And what we use is called a seven and a half minute quadrangle. And the scale there is a one to 24,000. So that means that for every inch on the map, you move 24,000 inches in real life. So it's a pretty, pretty big scale, but um, it covers a lot of area, which is good because then you don't need as many maps. Um, but each of these maps will have a quadrangle listed at the top, the name of the quadrangle. It will have where it's located in whatever state it's in. It will have um, publishing information, a scale, some extra notes based on what's happened with the map. And then you will also see um, a magnetic declination here. And then on each side, so each side of the map and then each corner of the map, it gives a name and that name tells you what map you would need to go to next if you needed to continue in that direction. So for example, north is up here on this map. If you needed to go continue northeast, whatever this says here, it's really, really small, so I can't read it either. <laughs> that map, let's just say it said half dome you would find the half dome quadrangle. And so each of the maps kind of connect together like a puzzle and you can easily move from one map to another. Now, if the map you're looking at is not a quadrangle from the USGS, 
it's not going to have all that information on it and you're not going to be able to move from that map to another map um, as easily, which is why we have this. So when a map is being made, the first thing they do is they pinpoint specific locations across a landscape and get those elevations. Those elevations are then projected on average around the landscape. And then that landscape information, that elevation information is projected down. So you can see here, this is a cross section. So it's like cutting a mountain in half and looking at it. And you can see the lines where the elevation is the same. So if you walked across this mountain here, you'd be walking across the 1200 mark or the 1300 mark. And so the elevation would stay the same as long as you didn't go up the hill or down the hill. So then that is projected down onto a 2D surface, which is the map view that you view. And so it kind of compresses everything. And then you can kind of see, well, there's two little points here on this hill on the right. And you can see them depicted on the map view as well. And so it's just pulled down from that elevation down onto a map. And then they create the map. All right, so in general, our contour lines are always going to form closed loops. So even if your map doesn't show it, so this Cedar Mountain quadrangle here doesn't actually show all of the completed loops, it's because they go to the next map. So here's an example here. If you wanted to continue northeast on this map, you would have to find the Tracy quadrangle next. Okay, so all of the contour lines should form a closed loop on more simple maps, smaller maps, and, you know, example maps, not necessarily quadrangles, you're going to actually see the isolated hill or the closed loop on them. So you'll have a combination of maps to work with in lab. You'll have some that are quadrangles and some that are a little bit more simple example maps. So um, this is a little activity within this lecture that you can pause and see if you can understand. Um, but you're going to try to match the cross section to the map. So the map is on the left. So these are the topographic maps that represent these different cross sections. And so you'll just take a minute, pause the video and see if you can figure out how they match and if you can match them up or not. Okay, so take a second to do that now. All right, so did you get it? <laughs> so this first one here at the top matches with cross section B. So as you can see, there are more contours on the right side of this map than on the left, but it does show two little humps. So two circles represent two little hills. And so on B, it has two hills. A has two hills, but they look about the same. And then D also has two hills, but those also look about the same. So since there's more contour lines on the right-hand side of this one, it's most likely B because it's a higher elevation. So the more contour lines you see, the higher the elevation is going. Okay, then we get into number two. So number two matches with E, so it's an isolated hill and it's fairly steep and it's right in the center. So if you look at the other isolated hills, C and F-ish, um, e is the only one that is in the center. So that one clearly matches E. Um, number three matches D. It matches D and not A because A has a much bigger dip between the two hills, whereas D doesn't. And as you can see, there's only two contour lines before you get to the top of hill D. So this one would match better with D than A. Number four matches with C. It's an isolated hill off to the left there. So again, C is an isolated hill off to the left. And then number five is similar, but you can kind of see a difference between four and five in that five has a much um, more flat top. So that last contour line there, there's not another little one to suggest that there's a peak. Whereas on four, there's another little contour line that suggests there's a higher peak. And so five matches with F pretty well because you can see the flat top to the right of the map. And then six, of course, is A. Um, six shows two isolated hills and there's a lot of contour lines from that baseline in the middle. 
And so that suggests steeper hills on either side. All right. So when we're looking at contour maps, another thing that's really important is understanding that the difference between contour lines is called the contour interval. And each map is going to be different. The USGS maps try to keep pretty consistent with either 20 or 40 meters. Um, but some maps like this one are only 10 feet. And it also depends on what um, unit of measure you're in. So this unit of measure is 10 feet. A lot of USGS maps try to do feet and meters. So you have to be careful with what you're looking at. Um, they might give you options. And then sometimes they're going to tell you this is in meters or this is in feet. Um, in the United States in general, most of our stuff is still in feet. We're not on the metric system for whatever reason. <laughs> but um, so you're going to be looking at the difference between contour lines. So the way you figure it out, if it doesn't specifically say on your map what the contour interval is, is you're going to look at the lines and figure out the difference between them. So here we have a 700 line and a 750, but there's lines in between. So to get from 700 to 750 here, it looks like it goes by tens, right? So 700, 710, 720, 730, 740, 750. Okay, so that means that the contour interval between each line, line to line, is 10 feet. Um, I will talk about why some of these are darker. Uh, actually, in the next slide. So some of the lines are going to be darker, and those are called index contour lines. So every fifth line is usually printed a little bit darker than the other lines. So you want to pay attention um, to the lines in between as well because they count as your elevation and they count towards your contour interval. Um, but to make it a little bit easier on maps, if they get really crowded, they don't label the elevation of every single line. They'll label the elevation of the index contours only. So when these contour lines get really close together, we're looking at a steeper slope. So the closer the contour lines are together, the steeper the slope is. And the reason that is, is because you are gaining elevation quickly over a small horizontal area. So if you have a big horizontal area, so a big distance to change this elevation, you're going to get a more gradual slope. So here when we're looking at this map, we're seeing a much steeper section here on the left and a more gradual section here on the right, just looking at the spacing of the contour lines. So this is extreme when you go to Yosemite because we have things like El Capitan, which is an overhanging monolith. Monolith is a single body of granitic rock. And not granitic specifically, but this one is granite. So it's an overhung cliff, and so the contour lines cannot be fully represented on a map. So the map on the left, you can see a lot of lines kind of overlapping, and it's really hard to depict every single elevation on this map because it's a vertical, a almost vertical elevation change, um, so you can't represent every single line. So it kind of gets very clustered, and so you can really tell that it's really steep right there. The same thing with Half Dome. So here is Yosemite Valley here. Half Dome is over here. And so you can see how everything is kind of, all of the contour lines are very close together. And this one isn't even nearly as steep as you get to the base of Half Dome. So you can kind of see where all of your cliffs will be by just looking at a contour map or a topographic map and understanding that the closer those contour lines are together, the steeper that your slope is going to be. So we've done this a little bit already, but this is looking at steep slope versus gentle slope in cross section and in map view. Um, so over here on the steep slope, you can see there's a lot more contour lines. They're a lot closer together, whereas with the gradual slope, the contour lines are further apart and you see a lower elevation slope and a gentler slope. Over here, you kind of have the combination. So on the left, we have steep slope. And on the right, we have gradual slope. So in cross section, this is approximately what it would look like. Just kind of getting you to understand the difference between the cross section and the topographic map and what that means for steepness of slope. So 
Here's another look at the wide space contour lines. Here you have a steeper slope on the right, so you would represent that in your cross section. And then on the left, you have a more gradual slope where the contour lines are further apart. So sometimes this happens in like a meadow setting where um, the meadow does increase in elevation, but it's very gradual. So on the map, it doesn't look as extreme as like Half Dome and El Capitan were looking. There are also streams on the maps. So a map that, ha that covers an area where there's water is going to be depicted. And streams tell you a lot about the landscape because they control the way that the contours are looking. So as water in, in sizes, I guess is the word I'm looking for, the landscape, it starts to cut into it and erode material away, and it pulls back those elevations uphill. And so you get kind of this bending of your contour lines that point uphill. So we have something called the rule of V's, which says that your contours bend upstream and they V upstream. So the V portion points to uphill, not the direction of flow. So this can be helpful in trying to decide whether you're going uphill or downhill in a certain direction. It can also help you decide which direction a stream is flowing. So for example, here, if you look, the stream is flowing towards the bottom of the page and the V's are pointing towards the top of the page. So downhill, water flows downhill, right? So downhill is gonna to be towards the bottom of the page. Okay, so with contour lines, we're looking at elevations that are averaged across a landscape, but that doesn't always give us a specific elevation of a hill. Sometimes they'll be there, and I'll show you what that what those are called in a second. Second, But if it's not labeled on the map, then you have to figure it out based on the contours that are already there. So to figure out a hill elevation, you would take the maximum possible elevation. It's one less than that. So here we have 50, 60, 70, 80 contour lines depicted. 90 would be the next one, but it's not depicted. So you would say the next one would be 90, so that it would be minus one, the maximum possible elevation of this hill would be, oops, it's not there, 89. <laughs> so 89 would pop up right there. And so it would be one less than what the next contour line is that's not represented. It might be 85, it might be 84, but you don't know that information unless you have a specific measurement. If you don't have that specific measurement, then you're going to guesstimate it's one less than what would next be represented on the map. Okay, so if you do some practice here, um, if you look at these different elevations, so we have 200 here, the contour interval is 20 meters. So this next line would be 220. And then the line that would exist next would be 240. We're gonna subtract one, we get 239. Same thing over here. So we have 100, 120, 140, 150. Uh, oh, I missed one. This one's 160. And then 180 would be the next one. And then you subtract one, 179. Okay, so you'll want to look for one less than the next contour line for your hill elevation. Now, when we're looking at a low spot, which we call a depression, we're going to be doing the opposite. So if you see a line with a bunch of hashier marks on it, like this is this image here, this is a depression. So it's going to be a repeat of the lowest contour line next to it. And then I'll show you how to estimate the low point there. Okay. so the lowest possible elevation, and then you plus one, right? So it's kind of the opposite of the hill. So we have 90, 80, 70, 60 here. The next possible one would be 50. So this line down here would be 50. And so we add one to that, and that would be 51. It could be 53, but we don't know that, right? If it's not labeled, we have to infer, and this is how you would infer.
If we look at this one, we have 800, we have 760. And I know this is uh, kind of hard to read, but the, I think it just says a title that says it's the, we're talking about contour lines and depressions. And so we have a 40 difference here. So that's our contour interval is 40. So the next one here would be 720. We're going to add one, so it would be 721. Okay. Some other rules of depressions are whether you're looking at the top of a hill or a side of a hill. So if there is a repeat of elevation on both sides of the depression, then we're looking at the top of a hill. So this is a depression in the center, so it's probably something like a volcano or a volcanic plug maybe. Um, maybe a caldera that collapsed. There's lots of different things it could be. Um, and then a side of a hill is going to be a repeat on the downhill side and no repeat on the uphill side. Okay, so it kind of goes stagnant, then goes downhill, but on the uphill side, it just continues going uphill. So this would be something like a landslide or a sag pond from fault motion, um, but this would tell you using these rules whether you're looking at the top of the hill or side of the hill. All right, so then we also have things like raised relief maps, which are basically 3D models of a 3D world. Um, they have lots of bumps on them. We have some in the lab. If you're curious, you can come in and uh, run your hands over them. They're really interesting um, to kind of mess around with. They can be kind of delicate, <clears throat> so we'll be careful with them. Um, but it does give you an actual 3D representation of what the terrain looks like. Um, so it's pretty interesting to look at. And then I was talking about specific measurements. When we're looking at specific measurements, we call those benchmarks. So these are going to be locations where there is an exact elevation known, and it's marked with one of these brass or aluminum plates by the United States Geological Survey. And so on your map, it'll either have an X or it might have a BM next to it. Um, but the big telltale sign is always that it has a very specific measurement. So instead of saying this is 80 feet here or this is 1,205 feet, it'll say something like this is 872 feet. Or for this one, it says 14,258 feet. Um, so you want to look for kind of exact measurements on your map and then I'll tell you you're looking at a benchmark. If you ever want to see one of these in the field and you don't want to travel very far, um, there is one on Herndon, no sorry, Leonard and Ashland in Clovis in front of like Reagan Elementary School. There's one in the sidewalk right there that I've seen um, and there's a few others throughout town that I've seen. They're just a little harder to get to. That one's just right on the sidewalk right on Ashland. Um, so that's really cool to see um, in real life. All right, so here's a look at the benchmarks that you might see on maps. Um, here we have an X and a BM, but you can see this is 2,296 feet. So it's a very specific measurement. Over here, we have one of the triangles with the dot in the middle, and that one is 1,205 feet. Um, so that tells you that you're looking at a benchmark. We have another one with an X, 998 feet. So those are benchmarks on your map. You'll also notice they don't fall in line with the contour lines, right? Your contour line measurements are kind of in line with the lines as they run through the map. All right, scales are also very important because we're taking a very big area and putting it onto a handheld map. So our scales are going to vary by map. Um, but there's usually some sort of scale on it somewhere. This is what a USGS scale would look like on a quadrangle. So the contour interval here is 40 feet, and the scale is 1 to 24,000. And that 1 to 24,000 means that for every 1 inch on the map, you're moving 24,000 inches in real life. But it is a unitless measurement, so you can see say that a foot on the map is 24,000 feet in real life. The problem with that is you can't, it's harder to measure a foot, right? Um, so most people usually do inches or they do centimeters. Um, if it is a English measurement, not a metric measurement map, I would stick with inches. If it's metric, I would stick with centimeters. Okay, so we have the numeric and we have the verbal. 
And then we have the graphical. So the graphical is that graph showing you the distance measurements. And so you can take your ruler and measure it. The um, numerical is the fraction that I already mentioned. These are a couple of other examples. So 1 to 63,360 or 1 to 100,000. Those are numerical or ratio scales. And then the verbal scale is written out. So it says verbally that these many inches mean these many inches in the real world. So that's usually just the ratio scale written out, but maps like to save room. So there's less of these. These are less common now. They're starting to delete them from maps that they produce because they take up a lot of space just to say the same thing that the ratio does. Another thing that's gonna be on a map is a magnetic declination. These are really important because our compasses use the Earth's magnetic north pole to navigate. So if we have a compass that has not corrected for where we are on the earth, it's not going to give you the right direction. So you have to adjust your compass to the magnetic declination of wherever you are on earth. Because our magnetic north pole and our true north pole are not the same. And at different areas on different parts of the planet, they're gonna be different. So there is a declination lookup that you can click on here. It'll be linked in the slides. And you can look up for a particular part of the world what the magnetic declination is. Now this is also going to be present on your map. So on this USGS map here, you can see that there is a magnetic declination here. So true north is always the star and Magnetic north is always the MN, and it gives you a degree difference. So you would take your map, or sorry, your compass, and you would adjust it 19 degrees from true north, and then it would correct itself so that it actually points north for you wherever you are, whatever this map is. Okay, so you want to make sure that you do that and be able to locate where that is on your map. And usually it's at the bottom somewhere alongside the north arrow. All right, another important thing we need to know is gradient. So this is slope. So if you ever thought in math that you would never use rise over run ever again in your life, here it is. <laughs> so gradient is the difference in elevation between two points. So we're going to be looking at the slope of this mountain. We have a change in field value, which is our elevation from one point down here at the lower elevation to the higher elevation. And then we're going to take that and divide it by the distance. So that's the rise is the elevation and the run is the distance between the two points. Okay. So if you had an example here, so there's a trail that is four miles long as measured by a scale on the map. The beginning of the trail is 1,060 feet and the end of the trail is 960 feet. Calculate the gradient of the trail. So then you would just take the difference between the two elevation measurements that were given. So that's 1,060 minus 960 divided by four. So that's 100 over four, which is 25 feet per mile. So that means that for every mile you walk in this scenario, you're actually losing 25 feet of elevation. Okay. So normally you'd be calculating this for uphill so that you know how many elevation, how much elevation you have to gain as you walk each mile. Um, but in this instance, I gave it to you kind of backwards, so you're walking downhill along this trail. All right, so this is an example that I'll have you calculate, and I won't give you the answer here, um, but it will be in the quiz. Um, so you'd like to travel the four mile trail in Yosemite. If you don't know what the four mile trail is, it takes you from Glacier Point down into Yosemite Valley, or you can go the other direction and walk up it, okay? So you want to know what the slope is before you begin, because it sounds really strenuous. So it is famously called the four mile trail, but it's actually 4.8 miles. So it's not really four miles. Now, the base of the trail has an elevation of 4,000 feet on the valley floor, Yosemite Valley. And it goes all the way to Glacier Point, which has an elevation of 7,200 feet. So how much elevation will you gain on average per mile? So do the same thing that I just showed you in that last example, apply it here, and let's see if you can get the answer. 
All right, moving on to looking at compasses. I won't go into super detail here, um, but this is a standard compass and it comes with a few different things. There's a nice ruler on either side, which is really helpful when you're working with a map. Um, you have the base plate, which is what the ruler is actually on. Uh, you have the direction of travel arrow. So that is this little needle. You have the red housing. Um, and then that needle housing also rotates. When you are trying to navigate where you're going, you always want to get the magnetized needle, which is this red pointer, into the orienting arrow, which is your red in the shed. So you always want to get that aligned there, and that will tell you that that is north. Okay, And then from there, you can do other navigating. Um, and if you want to learn how to fully use a compass and navigate, this video is actually amazing. REI has some really good maps and really excellent videos on how to use the maps um, and how to navigate. So I recommend this video. I will also link it in your module for you, um, as well as another video by them um, that I find really excellent. It kind of gives a different perspective, more of a hiking perspective than a geology perspective. All right, and then this week you're working on the topographic map module. Um, make sure you're doing the lecture, the lab, and the homework that is there. And I will catch you guys in the next lecture video. Bye.